sir, start the session. Although the Dr. Ramamurti, who, had, who was supposed to chair the session, is probably held up in traffic, and Dr. Kumar is also not here. So myself, Dr. Roop, and Dr. Saurav, we are starting the session for the sake of the saving the time. And uh, as soon as other people join, they can definitely join us here on the dais. So I firstly, I invite Dr. Shri Ganesh. Sir, please. Dr. Shri Ganesh would be talking about the ice stem technology a paradigm shift in glaucoma management. He is the master clinician and a great innovator, needs no introduction, not only in India, but worldwide. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning, dear friends. And uh, today I'll be speaking about the ice technology, which has been recently introduced, and uh, also our initial results with this device. I am a consultant to Carl Zeiss Meditech and Biotech. So if you look at the world population and glaucoma, uh, why should we intervene earlier in cases of glaucoma? So between 2020 sir, and 2026. Uh, just, a, just a moment, I think they are not. Uh, oh, sorry, my slides are not up. Okay. Excuse me. Going here, but it's not. Yeah, okay. So, why should we intervene earlier in uh, glaucoma? Because t between 2020 and 26, the population of the 60 plus years will grow worldwide. In 2021, 13.8% of the population are over 60 years. In 2050, 19% will be over. 60 years, and this is the age group which is susceptible for glaucoma. So if you look at the Indian perspective, there are about 16 million uh, cases of glaucoma, and 63% of uh, them are on medication. That's 1.65 million patients on glaucoma. 90% of these cases are undiagnosed. And uh, even if these patients are put on medication, the adherence to using the medication is only 53% post six months. So the direct cost of treating glaucoma increases as the disease progresses. That means you will have to put the patient on more number of drops. 84% of the economic cost of treating glaucoma lie outside the health and social care system. This is the data from UK. And if you look at the cost of the devices. You may think that it is expensive, but if you look at the cost of the devices, it's actually relatively small compared to the cost of the medications being used. And apart from the cost of the medication being used, there's also a cost of informal care, quality of life costs, and productivity costs, which increases much more. So actually using these devices to treat glaucoma um, early is more beneficial for the patient. If you look at the treatment options today in India, you have medications, you know, you all know the various medications from prostaglandins uh, to uh, basic medications like pilocarpine. You also have laser trabeculoplasty. Then for advanced cases, you have filtering surgeries like uh, trabeculectomy and uh, ocular implants. But if you look at the patients on medication, like I said, only 53% adherence to medications uh, post six months. So now there is a new entity, which is microinvasive surgery being introduced, which is the trabecular micro bypass surgery, which lowers IOP by increasing the trabecular and the uveoscleral outflow. And this is making a paradigm shift for in treatment of mild to moderate glaucoma. So if you look at the device itself, the eye stent inject, it has got two devices in an injector. And if you look at the anatomy of the device, it's got a rare flange, which is basically retained in the anterior chamber. In the center of the flange, there is a central uh, inlet. You can't see it here. The central inlet is 80 microns in diameter. Then it's got a neck. 
which basically sits in the uh, trabecular meshwork. And then it has got this nozzle here with four side outlets, which are 50 microns in diameter, and a central outlet, which is 80 microns. So it's like a hollow tube of 80 microns, and then 50 microns outlet. So the eye strength is designed to enhance visibility, it, to facilitate seamless placement in the trabecular meshwork, and provide observable positioning confirmation, and uh, deliver consistency and predictability of the procedure. So this is the animation of the procedure. You go in there and then inject the eye stent, and this is a successful implantation. Then you move two clock away, hours away, and implant the second device. There is a button which you can press, which shoots the device and implants the device, and then you retract the injector. So eye stent is uh, designed to deliver an optimized access to the multiple collector channels along outer wall of the Schlems canal without relying on extreme dilatation or scaffolding. And the arc of flow can span at least five to six clock hours. And it can also reestablish flow in previously dormant outflow channels. So there are some interesting studies. There was an aqueous angiography study conducted by Alex Fan. And you can see the uh, aqueous angiography before the eye stent is implanted. And you can see just there's one collector channel there. But then after implantation, you can see how the collector channels, you can see how the collector channels open up and then improve the drainage in this area. So there's also another uh, interesting study of the uh, ASOCT by Gilman. And he performed five AAC OCT scan uh, in each eye, one section directly above each eye stent uh, inject, and uh, one section 500 microns away from the eye stent inject, and one uh, on the temporal limbus. And then what he found that uh, 12 months post-op, the major diameter of the Schlems canal had significantly increased in operated versus unoperated eye. There was a 70%, 75% increase next to the eye stent inject and 46% uh, increase in the opposite limbus. So the increased aqueous flow resulted in a significant circumferential diameter of the Schlems canal while maintaining the integrity and physiological functions of the trabecular meshwork. So it's like a, a, a flexible pipe, which is 360 degrees, the Schlems canal. And then once the pressure in one area increases, this transmits to 360 degree and there's a dilatation of the whole Schlems canal and improved outflow. The other important aspect of the eye stent is the tissue preservation. And uh, we know that the trabecular meshwork has several important physiological functions. It's shown to function as a mechanical pump. And you can see the um, video there, which shows the movement there. And it actively shunts the aqueous humor into the Schlems canal. And of course, the meshwork cells are actively phagocytic and may play a role in controlling IOP. And if you remove the trabecular meshwork, like in procedures like goniotomy or et cetera, you can remove the blood aqueous barrier, and it can contribute to the pathophysiology of inflammatory ocular disease. So what are we targeting in mild to moderate patients? In mild glaucoma, the initial IOP range could be kept at 15 to 17 millimeters of mercury. That is a target IOP. In moderate glaucoma, a target IOP would be 12 to 15 millimeter. In severe glaucomatous damage, ideally it should be in single digits. So IOP of 14 to 18 is a drop of 25 to 30%, and uh, less number of drops may be required, better compliance, and it can halt the progression of glaucoma. There was a study uh, by Richard Lindstrom uh, over four years on uh, using the eye stent as a standalone. That means not combined with cataract surgery and on patients with one uh, medication. And uh, if, if you look at the outcomes, there was a drop in uh, the pre-op IOP of around 24.4 to around 13.2 uh, um, over 48 months. And 95% um, with IOP less than uh, 18 millimeters and 82% with IOP less than 15 millimeters. And only one eye underwent uh, secondary glaucoma. 
surgery. So 46% IOP reduction and 95% of these patients were medication free. If you look at the meta-analysis uh, studies using iStrain device in standalone procedures, uh, 13 studies and 778 eyes and a follow-up between six months and five years, you can find that the uh, IOP dropped for, from over 25 millimeters of mercury to about 15 millimeters of mercury. And even the prospective case series also showed a similar drop in the IOP. So regarding the disease stability, there is 20 years of data, um, 20,000 eyes studied in 20 plus countries, uh, 16 studies with four to eight years follow up and 40 plus studies demonstrating the protective effect of the eye strength against progressive visual field loss. So if you look at the disease stability in standalone cases, this is the visual field uh, mean defect. You can see there's any, hardly any progression over five years. Even in cases combined with uh, cataract, it is very similar, 6.6 .6 to 6.7. And uh, if you look at the RNFL uh, damage, again, there is hardly any progression, 82.1 versus 80.9 in standalone and 81.4 to 80.2. And the CD ratio also remained fairly stable, both in standalone and the uh, combined procedures. So there was also, a, if you look at the quality of life outcomes, there is uh, improvement in the ocular surface because you are going to reduce the drops being used or eliminate drops being used. And the mean OSI score reduced from 40.1 to 17.5. And even the TBUT also improved and uh, the corneal and conjunctival st uh, stain and hyperemia reduced. So which are these patients who are suitable for the eye strength inject? Mild to moderate open angle glaucoma uh, pseudo exfoliation of pigmentary glaucoma, CD ratio less than 0.8, pre of IOP of up to 30 millimeters, and uh, target IOP of uh, 15 millimeters, where you want to achieve about 15 millimeters of mercury. Fakic or pseudo fakic uh, patients, patients who have difficulty taking medications, patients with side effect to medications, patients with poor compliance, patients who would benefit from a reduction in IOP or reduction in medication. They should have a normal angle anatomy. Uh, determined by gonioscopy and absence of peripheral anterosymmetry. So coming to the global experience of the eye strength inject is uh, 15 plus years um, and then over 1 million uh, eye strengths uh, implanted, 250 plus articles which are published. And this is one case which I have done combined with uh, cataract. So first I do a temporal uh, clear corneal incision of 2.2 uh, millimeters. That's the capsular excess being performed and the hydro. You can see that this is almost like a three plus to four uh, nucleus sclerosis. And this patient had both uh, dense cataract and also uncontrolled glaucoma on three medications. And uh, this is the FACO and that's the last fragment being removed. IA is performed for complete cortical cleanup. And then uh, this is a single piece uh, IUL being injected into the capsular bag. And uh, once you do that, then uh, you put in the viscoelastic and place the gonio prism there. Use a heavy uh, coercive viscoelastic to maintain the chamber. And that is the eye strength inject. You go and then you extend the trocar. You can see the blood in the Schlem's canal and the trabecular vesper. You, gentle, you put gentle pressure and then press the button so that the eye strength is delivered into the trabecular meshwork and you can see the implantation and you can see the ooze from the Schlem's canal. So if you get blood oozing, it shows that you are in the Schlem's canal. You move about two to three clock hours away and then again you depress with the trocar, the trabecular meshwork, indent it and then inject the second eye strength and again you can see some amount of ooze and that is the injector and there you have the two eye stents and you can put in viscoelastic sometimes just to clear the blood to see if the uh, eye stent is uh, in place and uh, that's the end of the procedure. So coming to our initial results, I'll just take one more minute. Uh, results of 18 uh, implants, uh, patients with mild to moderate uh, open angle glaucoma, we excluded primary open angle glaucoma, advanced glaucoma and secondary glaucomas. So the mean age was uh, 17 
uh, years and more males than females. Uh, 16 um, eyes underwent a combined eye stent and a cataract and two were standalone. And we had a five month follow up. This is a five month uh, in, uh, outcome. 78% had complete success and we were able to stop all medications. Um, so that is uh, 14 out of 18 eyes. And pre-op with uh, AGM, most of them on three drop was uh, pressure was 15.28. And post-op without AGM, it was 12.5 millimeters, the mean pressure. And we had 11% qualified success, that is two out of 18. Pre-op IOP was 25 millimeters, post-op IOP was 23.5 uh, millimeters. And there were two failure cases, pre-op IOP without AGM was 28, post-op IOP with uh, AGM was 19 millimeters. Be this is probably because the stents were not properly placed. And the IOP drop on an average was 14.67. The AGM reduction was 66.7% on an average in these cases. And 77.8% of patients were drop free. So the eye stent can be conducted with the cataract surgery. It's an elegant procedure with excellent safety profile, reduces IOP and allows uh, drop reduction, improves compliance and quality of life beneficial for mild to moderate patients and it shows disease stability in over five years period. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you have any questions? Yeah, uh, thank you sir for that uh, elaborate talk. Just a question about the learning curve, how difficult it is for a cataract surgeon to be... Uh, you know, Actually for a FACO surgeon, the learning curve is not very difficult. What you need to do is visualize the angle structures, learn how to use the gonio prism. You will have to turn the patient's head and tilt the microscope at about 35 degrees, angle 35 to 40 degrees, so you are able to clearly visualize and you have to use high magnification. Regarding the eye stent, uh, inject itself using the eye stent, it is very important that you should not bend the trocar. So you should visualize. So what I do is medium magnification, I put in the uh, trocar cannula, then I'm able to see the trabecular meshwork. Once I go close to the trabecular meshwork, then I increase the mag. And then I just gently indent. If you indent too much, you will have an over implantation. And then it gets buried in the trabecular meshwork and passes the Schlems canal, and then it does not work. So the mild indentation, and then you inject it, and then move to trocar hours. And very important is that you should not move the trocar, because trocar is very thin. If it bends, then again, it will not deliver the eye strength properly. And when you move it horizontally, you can see it. But when you move it vertically in the microscope, it's difficult to see. So you should be very aware not to move the eye. So if you take these precautions and use a proper viscoelastic and see that it is implanted in the correct place, uh, that is important. When you start off, you can uh, block the patient because sometimes some patients are not cooperative. They are moving. And in patients with uh, many of these patients are high myopes. So when you have high myopia with glaucoma, then the eye is very compliant. And that's when the viscoelastic leaks out and the cornea gets distorted because it's compliant and your visibility reduces. So in such cases, you have to be careful not to depress on the wound and to use a uh, coercive viscoelastic and then maintain the chamber and so that the visibility is good. Sorry, I just had a question. On what basis did you decide that the disease was mild to moderate? Depending upon the visual fields, the CD ratio and the RFMA. Okay, yeah, that is a very important consideration that the disease has to be decided mild to moderate based on visual fails. And I wanted to add to what uh, he was asking, you know, gonioscopy per se, whether in the outpatients, definitely in the outpatients is a very poorly, um, you know, the uptake for it is very poor. So any cataract surgeon who wants to take up, or any ophthalmologist or any glaucoma specialist who wants to take it up, they need to do, they need to get used to, to uh, do a a gonioscopy in outpatients first, be very clear about these structures, and only then, uh, you know, yeah. practice intraoperative gonioscopy, which is completely different and then only Because proceed. in India, you have a higher incidence of uh, narrow angle glaucoma, and these are cases which don't do well. So you will have to do a gonioscopy in the outpatient and then rule out, see that the angle is open, the anatomy of the angle is kind of normal, there are no peripheral anterior sinicae before you post these cases. That's very they, important. And you can do a dry lab. 
See, if you ask the company people, they will help you with that. You do a dry lab where you can actually visualize and then implant. And what you can do is on your routine cataract patients, once you finish the cataract surgery, you can use the gonio prism and then uh, start visualizing the uh, angle and then look at the trabecular mesh work and see that you're comfortable doing that for a few cases before you actually try to implant the eye strap. You wanted to ask something? Quick question, then I'll ask Dr. Narin Chetty. See, if you implant it properly, it, because of the neck, which is that the anatomy of the implant is such that it goes and then there's a nozzle and a neck, it gets stuck in the trabecular mesh work and you can visualize it. What I do is I put a little bit of viscoelastic. Sometimes there's blood, I clear it, and sometimes I just touch the implant to see whether it is stable. So far we have not had, but you can have a implant. It is possible that it can get expelled. If it gets expelled, then it may move, it may touch the endothelium. So again, post-op, doing a gonioscopy post-op is very important, and you see that it's in place. So sometimes you can get a double implantation also. That, that means if you're very forceful, if you indent too much, and press, you can have a first implant and a second implant, so you have two implants in the same place, and then you find that the, when you move two clock away, uh, hours away and you want to implant, there is no implant. So you have to be careful of double implantation, over implantation. And also, uh, one you. of a small tip on uh, visualizing, like Ma'am was saying, sometimes it can become pretty challenging intraoperatively to visualize the structure. A small tip in this kind of case is, first you tilt the, eye to the, I mean, tilt, tilt the, head, the head, head and then nasally, and also you can angulate your microscope, you know, in such Some a way that the, the, uh, the angulation of the microscope is like this, and the head is also tilted nasally. 35 and to 40 degrees angulation. Makes it much more Many easier, of them yeah. have automated angulation, like the RTO, and even the new Luxar, yeah. which is coming from Alcon, they are bringing it, uh, bring out an automatized, yes. motorized, so you can have a motorized tilt, so you can set it to whatever, 35, 40 degrees, and then you press the foot pedal and the... Well, there is already a lens available where you don't need to tilt either the patient or the microscope or anything. You can do it uh, coaxial. In so, a you know, it's a, it's a growing market. Yeah. In a standalone case of glaucoma where we are not combining it with uh, cataract, which is the ideal position to place it and from where should we enter? You first make a side port with a MVR and let the trocar yeah. enter? Temporal. See, basically you make the incision temporal and you do a nasal implantation. That is best for visualization. Yes. You thank you. Sir. I think, uh, and I would like to invite, thank you, Sri Ganesh. Thank you. Um, Dr. Narain Shetty on telling about his clinical outcomes about and patient satisfaction with the new EDOF magnificent IOL made by IOCare. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank uh, AIOS for giving me this opportunity. Today, I'm going to dis discuss on our experience with the Magnificent IOL. Now, we have a lot of uh, EDOF or uh, presbyopic IOLs in the market, and one of the new IOLs or relatively new IOL in the market is the Magnificent IOL. Basically, it is more of an enhanced monofocal IOL where it converts the point focus into an extended uh, focus. Uh, that's why you get that uh, extended depth kind of uh, vision. So the, the uniqueness about this particular IOL, it had these uh, painted material technology which reduces the visual disturbance and also has higher modular transfer function. Uh, it's made of a material which is glistening free, a unique cast molding process to enhance the optical quality. It has uh, enhanced stability across uh, temperature gradients also. In terms of the rest of the design of the IOL, it's pretty standard. It is a hydrophobic IOL with the UV filter and the blue light blocker, and it has a square edge and so on and so forth. So this is our experience with uh, this particular IOL. When you look at the visual acuity, you look at the defocus, there's a significant improvement in the intermediate vision as compared to a monofocal. And when you compare this with the iHands IOL, uh, the performance kind of similar. But where this uh, lens shine is the quality of uh, vision, where if you look at the MTF, it is really good as compared to the monofocal. And here you can see the MTF cutoff uh, median uh, between the three IOLs, the Magnificent, iHands, and Technus. It performs really, really good. Uh, basically, the more the number, the better the quality. So here you can see the objective scatter index, the, mean, uh, the median value which we've got is 0 0.5, and uh, here you can see it and uh, compare it to the eye hands and the Technus one, which is, uh, is really good quality. Here, the lesser the value, the better the quality. So uh, among all the patients we operated, 100% uh, of the patients had unaided visual acuity of 20-20 for distance. 
the intermediate vision uh, patient had, 100% of the patients had 20-23 or better, and 40% of the patients had 20-25 uh, or better. In our group, uh, we didn't have any complaints of uh, glare and halos. So basically, the advantage of this particular IOL is you have improved uh, distance uh, uh, vision, uncorrected visual acuity, because it has a slight range, so you're a little off uh, here and there, you still the patient will have a good uh, distance vision, uh, unaided vision. Then you also have an improved intermediate uh, vision, which is better than a monofocal. There's uh, no compromise in uh, visual func function, and uh, usually there's no optical disturbances too. Now the issue is, now we have this many IOLs uh, or uh, press way pick options in the market. Now how do we choose? This is not just confuse the patients, it's confused us doctors also. How do we go about this? So I usually make it very, very simple. I just categorize all these IOLs into two, make it simple, make it diffractive and refractive. Okay, so if you have a, a patient who's interested in press wave option, you say, okay, there's only two lenses, diffractive, refractive, and then you take it forward. But how do you decide uh, which to put a diffractive and which to put a refractive? Here's a simple uh, uh, workflow. Uh, let's say if the patient is interested in some kind of a press wave option, first you need to see if the patient is suitable for a diffractive IOL, okay? So what is the criteria? It's pretty standard. Uh, you look at all these angle alphas, high order aberrations, look for any abnormality. Basically, the eye should be nice and neat uh, before you put any kind of diffractive IOL. And uh, let's say if it is suitable and the patient is normal in the sense, if he's not a type A personality, um, uh, you know, uh, always asking questions, unre un if he's, he doesn't have unrealistic expectations, then you can go ahead with a diffractive IOL. Now, uh, you have a scenario where he's a type A personality, I mean, he's uh, continuously asking you, are you sure there'll be no glare and halo? Are you sure, even though you said there is glare and halo, he keeps asking, are you sure it's not there? So if you have such a patient, it's better to go with a non-diffractive IOL, and obviously if he's not suitable for a diffractive IOL, you simply go ahead with the refractive. This, this makes things so much more simpler, even decision making for the doctor and the patient. So to conclude, uh, with the uh, magnificent IOL, uh, I mean, it has an ultra-high optical quality. Uh, it has really good uh, uncorrected distance visual acuity. The intermediate vision is superior to a monofocal. Uh, in terms of optical disturbance, uh, we have not found anything, uh, any disturbance in terms of glare and halo as of now. Uh, but uh, definitely, it is uh, much better than a multifocal IOL. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Narin. Uh, one question. Uh, regarding the pupil diameter of the patient, any particular contraindication regarding the pupil size of preoperative uh, for this see, particular IOL? See, the, these kind of IOLs usually it's not dependent on that. Uh, it's, it's pupil independent. Uh, the, but there are certain IOLs which are pupil dependent. So that's why the criteria is very, very crucial. You have to see, let's say, because it's not that you're going to put all these IOLs in your, uh, in your hospital uh, list. Whichever IOLs you put in your hospital list, you have to be aware which are pupil dependent and which is not pupil dependent, and then accordingly have your criteria modified and then move forward. I would like to share my experience with this IOL. I think it's a fantastic IOL, but uh, we have to be careful about the small pupils because this IOL basically has high power in the center and then it uh, goes on decreasing. So if we have a patient who possibly is going to have very small pupil postoperatively, then you have to be careful. Maybe microsynchrotomy or maybe a little bit of stretch during which happens most of the cases will help in the postoperative because these patients otherwise complain of blurry distance vision and uh, that is, has been my experience. Of course, these patients are few, but sometimes what happens when surgeon starts using these IELTS and he comes across one such patient who complains of blurry distance vision and he feels that IL is not working properly. I think. So, what is the pupil size for that patient? I think it, uh, two to two point five. If it is so two small, two then it's too small. It should be at least three millimeters. Yeah, I think. So there is a cutoff in this. Uh, so uh, yeah, absolutely. So there is the a thing pupil is, cutoff. Is what yeah, I found. And usually, what happens is uh, uh, it's very abnormal to have like uh, even scotopic, photopic. Both was so small. What was the photopic? This thing? was typically senile myotic patients, you know, so then, yeah, you have to be yeah, really absolutely. I think it's better to stretch in those cases. Yeah. It's very rare to get such cases, but if you do, it's good to stretch it. But nonetheless, I think if it is too small, better to avoid, uh, you know, all the stretching and manipulation, then it leads to prostaglandin release, and then you have uh, increased risk of macular edema. And instead, we can just keep it simple in such cases. If it is a really abnormal case, better to avoid. 
No, the point here is that there is a pupil size cutoff for using these IOL, one point. And two, if by mistake we do put, then the result is myopic. Because then the patient turns around minus two and becomes very unhappy. So if, have you faced that, Saurabh? Yeah, that's what I was. So then what, what do you do? So do you uh, uh, do something to the pupil or you? Yeah, we can do a, a dilate the down. pupil using the green laser. Yeah. We can just stick the spot yeah. and dilate. Even YAG laser can be done. Um, in, yeah, the same, sorry, in the same vein, can I just ask, Please. say if you need to manipulate the pupil, then would that be a contraindication for putting EDOF or? Uh, um, it is okay, ma'am. See, the thing is, uh, a uh, non-diffractive is still okay uh, mm -hmm. because it is m it's not as sensitive as these diffractive IOLs where let's say if there's complication because of excessive manipulation of the pupil or the iris, uh, it can have post-operative complications and uh, that might affect the quality because there is a compromise in contrast and uh, uh, overall a light which falls on the retina when you're going with the diffractive uh, as compared to a because you do end up with maybe, uh, you know, pupillary Sorry, size. With you do end up when you use, do pupillary manipulations, yeah. you do end up with a pupil size which is more than, you know, the normal physiological. You may end up with a 4.5 or 5 millimeter pupil. No, so for those kind of pupils, it still works. Man. It works well, but uh, that very rare cases where you have that small, my, my anyway, what would happen is you would have used expanders already for those pupils. What happens on a natural basis, the pupil would have expanded. Uh, I mean, uh, to keep that, it's not like you're gonna do it for the IOL, it's just that you're done naturally for the surgery. Automatically, the pupil becomes a little larger. I think so it's perfect. I think the mistake was that I used BHEX. Uh -huh. and not iris retractor because b uh -huh. doesn't cause that sphincter damage. If there was little sphincter damage, exactly, I think exactly. patient would have done better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Kamal, you want yeah, to say uh, something? Uh, am audible? Yeah. I, I think I agree with he there. Uh, he used a huge number. It is probably 18 plus seven months. Very happy with the lens. I agree with all of you here. But uh, one thing for people who want to start new is don't get fooled by the auto refractometry reading. You will get yeah. a myopia. Yeah, yeah. True. You will get a myopia with true, this. True. But your patient is not complaining, yes. number one. Number two, all my, f all my patients who are not dilating are the ones where I won't go for it. Even if I have a that's my only no for this. Otherwise, if I even a two pupil, post cat all the pupils the deepening of the chamber are bigger size than the pre-op. So these patients are doing well. So my no-go-to case is only where I am anticipating a full IRS or my pre-op note says not dilated, will require rings or hooks. And otherwise this lens is performing amazingly in my mind. Absolutely, mind. absolutely. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Naren. Thanks. I invite Dr. Rohit Shetty, his topic is very interesting because when he talks about completing a toolbox, then he should add in 2023 only. Only one is working. It's okay? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, Kumar sir, Dr. Saurabh Patwardhan uh, for this opportunity and all the panelists out here. My talk today is on uh, complete toolbox as a refractive platform and uh, no financial interest even though I do receive uh, research grants for different companies and work on different platforms. So when you talk about the complete toolbox, what are the tools which you require in 2023 as uh, Dr. Kumar sir mentioned? You need a fantastic diagnostics. You need the topography data to be connected in a very proper and healthy way to your machine. And also something, diagnostics and tools which helps us to prevent something unexpected in today's context. So I use different platforms, but one of the things which I've been, which I call the world toolbox is for this machine which connects both the Cirrus and Osiris from the uh, diagnostics to the laser platform 
of Schwinn, uh, which has different uh, generation of families, but what I use is 1,000 uh, hertz uh, machine. The first line of diagnostics starts with uh, the epithelium. The reason it's important is many toolbox softwares has a fixed epithelial thickness which you need to add. Let's say you're doing a removal of epithelium for a, say, keratoconus, or you're doing an epithelial removal for a PR case. So when you look at this, the peripheral and central thickness don't always match. When you use the diagnostics here, it's 57, and sometimes you may have a 60 in the center or maybe the opposite. So the big challenge here is how do you add this and that becomes your first important toolbox because you are able to customize every single case you do. And say 50 to 60% of the time from divine interventions, everything goes well because most of the epithelium is uniform. But you can't expect that every single time you'll have the same uniformity and especially in today's context when your ocular surface is not healthy uh, contact lenses are used more than 10, 12 hours. So these are the cases which makes it more different. We have to link today whatever you have to make sure that you don't end up in this, irrespective of whatever kind of toolbox you use. And that's where the whole concept of biomechanics and newer diagnostic modalities which will come. At this point of time, these are not incorporated into your toolbox, laser machines. But I think it's time in future, like how you have the imaging system linked to your microscopes, I think all this will be one day integrated into your machines. So how do you use this toolbox to make it more optimized? Use the imaging, use the data, use the language which coming from all your diagnostics and feed it into your machine. This is what a toolbox is all about whether you're treating a simple topography guided treatment, non-topography guided treatment, or you want to build on a presbyopic treatment. The healthy marriage is between the topographer and the laser machines. So this is what works here. And once you have all this export uh, planning, then you start looking at it. The first line of refractive surgery is let's look at PR case out here because that's what needs a little more customization. So when you get the PR case out here, you have different uh, toolbox options here, PRK, trans-PRK if you want to remove it with alcohol, LASIK, femtolasic, and relift. This again a customization. When you call relift because the laser energy when you do a relift on a cornea, the laser spots is completely different. So by mistake you put a relift instead of LASIK, your energy settings, energy pattern is completely different. You have two options. You have an abrasion free or a customization free. Customization LASIK is more like your topo guided treatment. In Alcon, you call it as an contourer. You can feed your epithelium. This is exactly what I said as the one of the first important toolbox out here. And then you can start your PR case. You can display without the epithelium and then you will have comparison maps. It's very important because in the comparison maps, you start looking at what is the ablation difference. If the ablation difference is not too high, then you can choose between the CW, which is a customized wavefront. When, they, when your ablation difference is too high, it means that the cornea is irregular and the topography is correcting a lot of other ablation patterns. To understand what it really does. This is again the third important toolbox for me. There's something called as a manager. The manager here is nothing but your personal assistant, which is inbuilt into the machine, which tells you a lot of things. It tells you what are the aberrations it, we have, looking at maybe at this order, eighth order now. And then you say that I don't want to knock off everything, I want to save tissue. And you can just call the minimized depth here. It picks up the ones which can just be ignored and only corrects one which needs to be corrected. There's a huge leap in your customization because you are suddenly from just blindly 
like a nuclear bomb effect you're picking up. In this case, it's saying that you don't even treat a spherical aberration. That's important because many times we unnecessarily treat spherical aberration. You lose your depth. You lose your focus. And this is what it, and in, in this case, it's just saying treat only the trefoil and some aberrations. And what you actually achieve is you achieve a much lesser depth of ablation. You're saving tissue. And uh, we have seen that the epithelial remodeling becomes much better and easier when you use more customized approaches. The true customization has a huge role in keratoconus itself. You can look at the topoguided treatment. And what is interesting here is you have something called ocular wavefront guided treatment. The ocular wavefront looks at, it uses a pyramidal abrometer. It looks at a total wavefront of your eye. So what I do is I pick up both the top, topo guided and the ocular wavefront guided. It's very interesting. This makes a huge impact in the way I do my keratoconus treatment because in the central ablation on a topo guided, because the topo guided assumes everything is from the cornea, the, the ocular wavefront will factor in the complete optical system and it looks at how the lens is compensating. For example, the total ablation here, the central ablation here is 28 microns. This is with the epithelium, so you cannot ignore it. And minute you do a ocular wavefront, it becomes nine microns. So in a nine microns tissue, you're able to make the cornea more regular, and which is just nine microns above the epithelium. And then for every single patient, use the same principle. Look at what you're treating, and then you go back to your ablations. Keratoconus is like an, a, a big, uh, you know, it's like a garden filled with all kinds of aberrations, good, bad, and ugly. The machine, once you minimize the depth, it picks up what it need, really needed to be treated and what needs to be ignored. And this is what it says, that many of your things which would have normally been treated just get ignored when you get, get it in gray, and the only ones which needs to be treated gets picked up. So what happens is, you are actually balancing this out. You're playing around with multiple ablations. And why is it lesser? If you go back and look at the summary, if you're doing the corneal wavefront, then you're treating four diopters of coma. But if you're doing the ocular wavefront, you're treating one diopter of coma because the three diopters is negated by the lenses itself. In a young patient, you don't need to treat everything on the cornea, and because of that, your ablation comes down from 24 to 9. It's a huge, impressive way of looking at how the wavefront ablation works. It's a beautiful video uh, of accommodation. This is from the lens. It's accommodating exactly the similar way of what your cornea is doing. This is a patient who had a 6-6 vision. He did not know that he has a keratoconus. And you probe in, he has, says he has nothing. It's a, such a beautiful video of how sometimes Lens can actually, it's a real time. It, uh, the Osiris is a machine which helps us to look at accommodation of all this. And this is, a, this is the software on it. And it's a beautiful way to customize it. And these patients, you don't treat them on any topo guided treatment because the minute you do, the lens becomes confusing. Then it starts creating a havoc. So it's so important to use your diagnostics to plan what type of treatment you want to do. And you can see that. This is why there is so much of a, a difference between the treatment. Some of the few examples of when you use the CW, there are times when the OW, the ocular wavefront is more because the lens is over accommodating. Then you can choose the corneal wavefront, you can do the ocular wavefront, when both you can choose either one of them. And these are a few examples of cases and how, and where you have now close to, my colleague Gairik is working on, close to 12 years of uh, working, and especially on this platform, close to six and a half years of working. When we can't express, when we can't treat anything on the laser, we published this work of doing a very customized PTK on the cone. And uh, now we have close to five years data on it. We call it as TREK, and when, when you don't want to treat it, TREK is just a very customized ablation, and you can see that you can ablate it very beautifully at any area of the cone and you can shave it up. And this exactly, this is a few examples of it. Phenom and this we just published in JCRS, just a few, uh, JRS a few 
uh, months back, and now we are getting ready with the six years data on this, very stable. And it gives you more strength into that zone. There's a few cases of doing customization using the toolbox. This is a pilot uh, who had a high refractive error post RK. And you can see what I can actually manually also pick up what I want to choose. And uh, I can choose between CW, OW, and multiple options. And uh, you can see these are, uh, this is what we treated. And you can see it's not great, but you can see that the cornea has become more aspheric, and he's planning for his cataract surgery later. And you can see the change in the aberrations uh, itself. Uh, to true customization, we are working on adaptive optics. We are trying to use adaptive optics to see if we can pick up the aberrations truly, which needs to be corrected and not corrected. This is a work in progress. Uh, we have Dr. Reshma and Dr. Bhavya, both of them in this, in this hall, and this is what we are doing. And this is the interest of time. We can induce aberration, we can remove aberration on a, like a foropter, and that is what I can actually feed on the machine, and that's what we do. And this takes a laborious work, but this is, I think, the way to go, and phenomenal. You can see that this example clearly explains how beautifully the, the keratoconus can be corrected if you don't correct unwanted stuffs out there. Uh, presbyopia treatment can be planned. It's too short to explain everything, so I'll just quickly go into this. And uh, there are multiple types of presbyopia planning which you can customize on this. Just a few things. You can work on scar correction. This is a patient referred to me with a central scar. He had, I think, a buttonhole or the flap loss has happened. And this is a scar which had happened. And this is how the bump looks it is. What we did is we customized the ablation. We removed what ablation, what we did not want. Uh, we looked at a small zone. We picked up what ablations we don't want to treat. And uh, we treated this in this fashion. And you can see that this is his post-op. And you know, these kind of cases normally would have need to go do a, even PTK will not work because a small, many small areas here would be knocked off. And here, hardly changes in the aspericity of the cornea. And this entire thing disappears. And this is his quality of vision. And you can see that the whole area just disappears at one go. We, we are explained that we may need two procedures uh, for him. So when you call it a toolbox, understand your diagnostics. You have to manage your good diagnostics with your machines. There are so many beautiful diagnostics, but sometimes our poor understanding to connect them is what, or our or, or learning in progress prevents us to uh, connect them well. Harness the optics and aberrations. Every aberration is not bad. You need to pick up the ones, and that is very difficult today. But as a toolbox, you can try to balance it out. And uh, future of adaptive optics, I feel there's a huge role of it. Very cumbersome, very long, and extremely tedious process. But if you can bring it in, that's going to be the game changer. And this machine has the capacity to do it. And uh, I, I've used it for a lot of scar co correction. I mean, if you really understand the way the cornea and optics behaves, this is a phenomenal leap in uh, the way it can be treated. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think. Uh a wonderful machine but I think the man behind machine we also need both of them I think so thank you so much and it's so elaborate I know that it may take two or three days for your lectures to understand each thing in detail and thank you so much for the contribution thank you so you stopped doing uh, intacts completely now to large extent yes yes waiting for the corneal abrasion do you think there's a differential uh, contraction of the ciliary body and a differential relaxation of the zonules? Because, I mean, how does it compensate? Generally, we think it's like a circular muscle, and then it, when it constricts, there's relaxation of the zonules. I mean, that's how accommodation works. But the, what is the mechanism of this, you know, lens compensating? And whether actually you should treat the refraction on the ocular wavefront and not the corneal wavefront, because I was uh, having a discussion with Kenelopolis, and he says you treat the corneal wavefront because what happens is these patients would have a lot of asthenopia because of this, you know, 
kind yeah. of accommodation which is partially happening and all that. And then after, the, by about six months or so, the lens kind of relaxes and then the patient is more comfortable and then uh, they have less asthenopia. So it's, it's, uh, it's a very difficult question because all of us, are all of us assume that the lens contracts yeah. and relaxes in the same way. But if you, even if you look at your eye tray, sometimes a lot of corneal aberration gets accommodated by, compensated yes, by the lens. This is actually a dive, this is actually a video representation of that, uh, uh, what eye tray shows. But I think mentally, we have to start thinking that that whole way of what optics we have been studying may not be always the same picture. If the corneal light is coming at, at an, like a prismatic angle, I feel the lens may actually accommodate into that prismatic uh, way of accommodation. To answer this question, there is no model on this, but every single model today is based on the same way as you mentioned, the way the ciliary body accommodates. But one thing we can do is, like in your eye trace, if you see a keratoconus patients and everything is matching on the lens and this, you do, you're absolutely right, you do a topogadet treatment, He's, he's going to be the most unhappy patient because the lens has used to his accommodation in a different way. And what happens is for the lens to have that memory that it has to go back to a different way of accommodation, it will take six to nine months time. So that is why many times we have burnt ourselves a lot on this. They say I was seeing very well before and you operated on me. Now if I see that there is a balance, we don't even, even if it's a minus one power to be treated and he wants it to be corrected, we tell him or he will, he will agree that it will take a year for him to get better. So the take home message is you just treat the refraction, it not o not only the cornea. Yes. Because sometimes there's always, a, there's some people say you, you always treat the cornea and the astigmatism on the so cornea. That is one people when, this is a Canelocolos belief, I think a lot of debate is on that yeah, because he has it. completely ignored the lens there. And because Alcon does not have an abrometer, so for them everything is in. Everything is. But now they will start about it because they have the Innovice coming. And Innovice is now using the same principle. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Rohit. I invite uh, Dr. Gitansha, who is uh, now using the Z8 system from Zimmer. And uh, it's a fantastic system. I've also been using this for more than a year, year or two, three months. So she'll tell us about her experience about the mobility of the system between six centers in a week. So, so my talk today is on our experience with the Femto LDV Z8, specifically for the use in clear. And I'll also touch upon the machine mobility. I have no financial disclosure. So the Femto LDV Z8 is the latest in the Femto LDV series. It has the CE mark. It has a wide range of applications which include elastic slab, uh, pockets for intracorneal ring segment implantation, keratoplasty, cataract. But today I'll specifically be dealing with the use for clear, which is corneal lenticule extraction for advanced refractive correction. So just a little bit about the machine and where it stands vis-a-vis -vis the current platforms. You can see that the laser pulse repetition rate of the Femto LDV Z8 is up to 20 megahertz. So essentially what you get here is a lot of very tightly stacked pulses, which gives you, which uh, clinically translates to a very, very smooth dissection. There's hardly any uncut tissue bridges that the surgeon has to um, open out. The energy pulse is less than 100 nanojoules. The laser cut time here is roughly about 30 to 40 seconds. But how the machine helps is with the new annular suction ring and the flat interface, the vacuum that you have and the hold that you have during the entire duration of the suction is so good that the incidence of suction loss in this is almost zero. It's been zero so far in our cases. Cyclotorsion compensation and inbuilt centration are some other applications that this device has that I'll be dealing with in the subsequent slides. So in these subsequent slides, I'll just be touching upon the advancements that I feel this machine has as compared to maybe the earlier machines or other machines in the market at the moment. So one thing that it does right now is that it factors in the Q value at the eight millimeter zone and the preoperative Q value can be fed in. 
So the machine retains the corneal asterosity that was there preoperatively. This also has a cyclotorsion compensation. Now we can decide where we want the centration of the lenticule before the vacuum. It can either be on the pupil or the marker or an automatic rotation as well. We also have a manual marking wherein the surgeon can, even after the vacuum and the dog, can manually move the position of the lenticule based on where they want it. So this is how the markings work. Essentially, you need at least two along the horizontal axis. A third one is additional, but it's optional. So what we need is that the marking should be at the limbus here and should ex extend at least 0.5 millimeters into the cornea. So this size would be acceptable. We could also go ahead and do a larger one. One should obviously make sure that the marks aren't smudged because that itself would be about two to three degrees and the machine does not take these markings into account. The maximum rotation that the machine allows would be 15 degrees on either side. Another additional uh, uh, thing that the machine has is that we have vending incisions. These can either be only on the posterior plane, which is at the plane of the posterior lenticule cut, or we can have both anterior and posterior vending incisions, which include the posterior uh, lenticule as well as the plane of the cap cut. Now, how these essentially help is there are two reasons. One is the lasers are more densely packed, so obviously there will be more OBL that's created. Secondly, this is a flat uh, interface. So since we're kind of pressing on the cornea, the space for these OBL to expand would be slightly less as compared to a curved interface. So the vending incisions essentially give you a channel for the excessive OBL to clear, and it gives you a very smooth dissection of the lenticule. It additionally allows you to make corneal side cuts. If required, we can make two instead of just one at the anterior or the posterior plane or both. So we just use one, but in the beginner, as a learning curve, one can use both the anterior and the posterior. Uh, we use both. Uh, the anterior and the posterior don't, I don't feel help in a sense that the anterior goes only to the cap and the posterior goes only to the uh, posterior part of the lenticule because it's a very smooth dissection and it kind of just goes in. But how this second cut can help is that it can be a rescue instrument. So if the first cut, if the surgeon has by fault gone into the posterior uh, plane and stuck the lenticule to the cap, then they can use the second cut as a rescue incision of sorts where they can then try to find the correct plane the second time and go in. A small caveat would be to leave about one millimeter ahead of it undissected. So in case you need the second rescue instrument, uh, incision to find the right plane, the area in front of it will be relatively untouched and it will be easier for the surgeon to then go on and find the anterior plane if required. Manual adjustment of lenticule position, as I had alluded to earlier, uh, can be done after the vacuum as well. So the machine essentially has this touch board wherein you can move it uh, all along the X and the Y axis. Uh, the machine gives you these guidelines, the safety guidelines. So if the cap and the edge of the lenticule is going beyond the pupil, the machine warns you. And also if it's going beyond the edge of the suction ring, the machine does not allow us to move the lenticule centration further. So this is just an overview of the treatment parameters that are allowed with this Z8. We can treat a maximum of 12 and a half sphere and a maximum cylinder of 10. The optical zone diameter can range from 4.1 to 8 millimeters, and the cap thickness can be between 70 to 170 microns. This is just a little about the machine mobility. So basically, uh, this is a, a vehicle that we have designed to take the machine across uh, six of our peripheral centers. This cabin behind is air conditioned, which allows to maintain the optimal temperature in which the machine has to be transported. We also have these protective pads on all three sides, so the machine is safe while it's being transported. And we've designed this hydraulic lift of sorts, which can move both along the X and uh, the Y axis. So it moves six feet up and down, and it moves about four feet in and out. So it's very easy. The machine comes on wheels. You just roll it onto this hydraulic lift. It then goes into uh, the vehicle, and it can easily be transported to the peripheral centers. So this entire thing of getting the machine from the OR all the way into the vehicle can take as little 
has half an hour. So just to put together everything that I've just said, I'll just show you a short video. So this, uh, you can enter the refraction that has to be treated. The target refraction is zero because we're aiming for emetropia. Um, this was the centration that I was talking about. We've chosen an optical diameter of 6.5 with a gap thickness of 120 uh, because uh, this was a fairly low power and we had enough residue as well. So this is how the uh, suction dock is. It's fairly simple even for beginners. So this is an annual ring that is locked onto the patient's eye when the patient is looking straight at a fixation light. Once the preset vacuum of about 70 millimeters of mercury is achieved, you then lower on the handpiece. And this is an applanating window that you can look into. And once it's centered, you just lower the dock onto the patient's eye. It then goes on to scan. You can see the pupil edge on the ring disc. <coughs> Sorry. The vacuum throughout is around 70 millimeters, which almost negates the incidence of suction loss. We began with the posterior venting incision and the posterior cut. This is followed by the side cut, which is then followed by the cap cut and uh, the corneal side cut. So this has both a spiral in pattern. After these cuts are over, the final venting incision of the anterior plane is formed. So this entire laser takes about 40 to 45 seconds, irrespective of the refractive power that one is treating. This is the second part, which is the surgical part. So we go in by entering vertically down, as we do in one-scale extraction, and then go on to delineate both the anterior and the posterior plane. Now, this is a real-time video. I have not edited it just to show you the ease of dissection. So I'm just going ahead and separating the, uh, this is the anterior dissection. This area is where the venting incision kind of connects with the cap cut, and one has to just be a little more cautious there while doing the dissection. So I proceed on to complete the anterior dissection completely. When we move on to the posterior plane, I prefer to do both the inferior quadrants on the left and the right hand side, but you can see that the dissection here is very smooth. So I leave behind what I call a wedge, which is essentially a little bit of an uncut lenticule on the left, because it gives me a counter traction so the lenticule doesn't roll over on the right hand side. After finishing the dissection on the right, just move on to separate that wedge. So what you get is a very free lenticule, which can then subsequently be easily removed. So I just discussed the result thus far. This is the only publication as of now on the results of CLEAR, wherein a retrospective analysis of 42 patients with 53 eyes was given. So this is a busy slide. I'll just uh, break it down for you. In terms of safety, 15% lost one line of CBVA, whereas 21% gained one or more lines of CBVA. Uh, Preoperative CBVA of 2020 or better was in 57% of the eyes, and a post-op UDVA of 2020 was in 51% of the eyes. In terms of predictability, they did not show any significant undercorrection for high refractive errors. 94% of the eyes were within 0.5 diopters, and astigmatism, 79% were within 0.25 cylinder. They did not report any cases of suction loss or abortive treatment. So uh, as of now, we have, uh, uh, our results we have seen in uh, 200 eyes of 102 patients. The mean age was around 26. The mean sphere was almost close to four and the cylinder was around 0.64. So you can see the progression of the corrected uh, distance visual acuity, uh, the sphere and the cylinder over a six week period, also at one week, you can see that there's a significant reduction in the sphere and the cylinder to around a mean of 0 0.02 and 0 0.08. In terms of efficacy, the preoperative CBVA here was better than the other cohort, but 95% of our eyes did have a pre-op CBVA of 2020 or better. And postoperatively, we achieved the UDVA in 89% of the eyes. 6.5% of our eyes lost one or more line of CBVA, and 4% gained one or more. 90% of them were unchanged in terms of the CBVA. Again, our study also did not show any undercorrection for high refractive errors. 97% of the eyes were within 0.25 diopter cylinder. 
And we also do not note any cases of suction loss or any cases of remnant lenticule or lenticule tear. This I feel is uh, exceedingly important and is one of the advantages here because while we were doing this at our center, we did train over 10 of our colleagues who were going to subsequently do this procedure in our peripheral branches. So I feel that the learning curve was very smooth and here the docking and the subsequent vacuum actually was very easy to achieve and since it's so stable throughout, there was no case of suction loss even in the hands of surgeons who were doing flare for the first time. Again, because the dissection here is very smooth, there were some cases where uh, the lenticule was stuck to the cap, which was subsequently retrieved. But because it's so smooth, there are no areas which are uncut or somewhere that the surgeon had to struggle or kind of pull at it. So there were no remnant lenticules or no tears that were noted in any of their eyes. So I'd just like to conclude that the outcomes thus far have been very promising. The complication rate, especially in terms of the incidence of suction loss, is almost zero. And the true mobility allows this advanced technology to be delivered at multiple centers and to have a more widespread use. Thank you. Uh, Mitanshan, that was uh, very good. Your results are also very impressive. What I'm surprised about, like we use many control platforms. But uh, I've seen this many years back, even in Switzerland, that they just wheel in the machine and they plug it in and they start. So do you take some precaution, like you plug it in two hours before, start the dehumidifier, start the air conditioning. Uh, do you make any special change or you just plug it in and start immediately? Uh, the warm-up time and getting the energy through and from the settings takes about two to three hours, sir. So essentially it's planned in a way that the surgeries are done in the first half and then the machine moves to the other center. And then that night it's set up in about two to three hours and then it's ready for you. I might just add to that. Uh, basically it has an application as far as clear is concerned. That's a lenticule. Then creation of flap and uh, laser cataract surgery also. And if it's only laser cataract surgery and flap, then we're almost able to use it immediately. But if it comes to lenticule extraction, the accuracy of the lenticule that's taken out has to be extremely accurate. So that in case that happens, then we take about a couple of hours to calibrate. So it's not necessary. We ensure that it's every time done once the machine is moved. But if it's just LRCS that's being performed or the flap that's being created, we can do it even without calibration. Thank you. Uh, uh, can I just make a comment, please? Uh, it's an excellent idea, uh, having a mobile setup, but is there any concern with regard to wear and tear, calibration, so on and so forth? So, thank you, Adnan. We, the vehicle that we've designed, uh, our team along with the team at CARE has designed. So, so far, like last week itself, the machine has traveled almost 1,200 kilometers between our peripheral centers. So, the machine is very safe, no issues regarding the wear and tear. As regards the calibration, uh, we just do a warm-up and we do the fluence check prior to every second OR. Uh, the results thus far, e even in the other centers, have been very promising. Just to see whether the calibration errors are resulting in any uh, slight visual outcomes. We're actually right now looking at the data of 75 eyes in the peripheral centers as well. Do you, by any chance, have a ded dedicated technician or? We have a technician, uh, an in-house technician of sorts. He's someone who uh, stays with us during the procedure and also shifts the machine and calibrates it. Thanks. Having said that, we don't want to sound over exuberant about this because we've been doing this only for the last couple of months. And only time will tell whether this kind of a daily movement of the machine will uh, it's able to take on and perform maybe after a couple of years or so. Okay. Uh, Kamal is going next then. IT is here. You are ready? Yeah, ready. Okay. Prakhyat, anyway, you come up because you are anyway going to go next. So, Kamal is going to tell us about 4,000 IPCLs. Yeah, Kamal, start. Okay, good afternoon everybody. I, I'm sorry to jump in, I have a session starting in the next room. 
So I'll be sharing my, my experience of uh, fakic lenses, um, very long follow-up, uh, very high number of uh, lenses which we've done. And we've practically done these fakic lenses in any kind of power I could get my hands on, any size of lens which I could figure out. And in many situations where I guess uh, there was no other option available but to put in a fakic lens and uh, we had the lens available manufactured to the requirement. So I have no financial relationship for the, any of the products I'll be talking about. There are various options available for us, but I'll be talking about my uh, an IPCL because that's the largest uh, experience I have. That's how the design of the lens is. So whenever we talk about the length of the lens, it's the diagonal length. It's not the linear or, or horizontal length. So we are talking about the diagonal length. So when the size which you get on the uh, box is this, this length, very, very brief exclusion criteria. There are some things which I've mentioned which are highlighted. Sometimes if you don't dilate the patient uh, completely, you may miss some lenticular sclerosis or lenticular changes. These are the places where I would say no to these patients and going for a lens extraction. Clear lens, uh, lens rise more than 600 microns. I would definitely want to have more than 3.1 millimeter of interior chamber depth, at least if I have a higher CLR. Angle from zero to 180 has to be more than 35 degrees, at least in my experience. Otherwise, you do land up with situations. Keratoconus patients do not get fooled by the very deep anterior chamber. The angle becomes very, very important in these keratoconus patients. So because you have a steep cornea, you can have a false anterior chamber depth. We've done nearly 4,000 cases. So this is the, the statistics of that. I'll just go fast. The major issues we've had were probably first with the V1 model. Whatever little cataracts we've, uh, I'm documenting here are because with the V1 model, the advantage with the V2 model is that it has an inherent vault by itself. It doesn't need to rest on something to develop a vault. So inherent vault approximately will be a 400 resting vault even if you keep the lens on a flat surface. So the chances of this lens touching the anterior lenticular surface are very, very remote. Number two, the size of the central hole is huge. So the aqueous flow is not compromised, further reducing your uh, uh, induction of cataract. So uh, redialing was done in cases wherever there was issue with the initial uh, marking till we got our nomograms right. Uh, I've had uh, patients who have developed retina detachment and had, uh, had to have a silicone oil. Of course, they developed cataracts. This is just a small study we did a couple of years ago, 300 patients subset. Majority of the patients were falling into the size of 12.5 millimeter and above, which is 97% of patients. The vault, majority of the vault which we saw was, you know, the 70% plus vault was landing within the required area. But one big plus point is I also have patients with 1100 volt or a one millimeter volt and they're doing fantastically normal because of the, the, the design of the product itself. So very, very high volts also the lens is tolerant. And I have seen that with this particular lens, you can rarely go wrong to have a very low volt until and unless your CLR was very high. So if you're keeping your eye on the clear, uh, crystalline lens rise, you can't go wrong. Uh, vision, amazing results, especially with astigmatism. And I don't think I'll mince my words, my response with high astigmatism with this particular lens is very good because of the stability of the lens. And secondly, with the, 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 the smart uh, category, which you know, the lens, you don't need to dial it. All you need to do is a good marking of your 0, 180 and you get fantastic results. It is available in very, very large sizes. I have put actually put lenses which have gone up to 8.25 millimeter of optic zones in patients who have very, very large resting corneas. Huge number of powers I put, I put till minus 34. I put astigmatic corrections till minus 14 now in corneal scars. Uh, this is how the design of the lens varies from the other uh, lenses in the market. It's not a straight truncated uh, design. It's a, it's a slanting design which reduces the uh, diffractions and uh, uh, glares and halos. The power availability is huge, but again, you can get the lenses customized, made to the power you want. That is the best part. I have got lenses made to the size of 4.5 millimeter. I will be showing you some videos. 
the lens, all you need to do is push, put it at 0, 180. So that's a big, big advantage. You don't need to refer to any chart. You don't need to do extra markings. You don't need to resort to any other gimmickry. Uh, few things I must mention. I, even for my ICLs, I see what is the resting pupil size and what is the maximum dilatation I have. Because what is the maximum dilatation I can achieve with the with midriatic also is very important, especially for a beginner surgeon. Let's say you have a 13.25 millimeter or a 13.5 millimeter lens to put in into a patient who's not dilating properly. So that can be very tricky, especially if you're a beginner surgeon. Number two, what is your resting pupil size? If your resting pupil size is, let's say, 6.56 or 7, then you are looking at a slightly larger size, even if you take into account the 25% of magnification at the condyle plane. So you definitely mention the large pupil size to, for, when you're booking your order so that you can work around it. The learning points I have noticed is I do not put any meiotic in the surgery during the surgery because I've realized First, it gives me a very, very wrong false vault within first one or two days. It gives me a shallower vault. Chances of having an intraocular rise are higher because the retained viscoelastic is there. And one thing I've noticed is that uh, once the effect of the pilocarpine disappears, the vault goes up by 150 to 220. And if you dilate the same patients, the vault goes up more by 150. So in few cases where I've had a low vault and I've ordered a new lens, and I'm waiting for the lens, I keep the patient dilated. And I have a resting vault of 350, 400. Like suppose I have a vault of 170, there's a problem with the measurement or something wrong has happened. I dilate the patient, tell the patient, okay, wait, and I put the patient on a midriatic. Meanwhile, the lens comes in. So once you dilate the patient, the vault goes up. So vault goes up by 150, 200, and that's a sure shot thing because we've done a measurement for that. So that's a big plus point here. First few hours, some patients may show IOP spikes, so we as a routine, once we do any fake lens, we have the patient sit for one hour or two after discharge and before they go, they are. So keratoconus, you have to be very careful, I've already mentioned. Uh, the angle, as I said, approximately measurement we've seen goes down by 15 degrees, 12 to 15 degrees, the angle may go down once you put the lens. When you're putting a toric lens, I use a trick. I the best part about the lens is it's available in a shift of 0.25 millimeter, unlike other lenses. So you can actually fine tune the placement and what you want. So in a toric, if I have a good anterior chamber depth, I do plan a higher vault. I plan a tighter fit because I want the rotation to be very, very secure. I don't want any rotation. So this is a trick I often play. I'll skip these videos. These are normal videos, I think. We'll go to something more interesting. Now, suppose you have a very large pupil. Do not overinflate with viscoelastic. Otherwise, you'll stop seeing the pupillary edge. So this is exactly what is happening here. I will just go, come out, release some viscoelastic, and then I'll start seeing the pupillary edge. So in case you have a very, very large pupil at dilatation, it's a good idea not to overinflate the anterior chamber. Once you have reduced the viscoelastic in the anterior chamber, so I'm just sharing a few, few interesting concepts and videos which I've developed over time. Now, this is one case where one of the haptics has not folded out completely. I'll fast forward. So you put, now in this particular case, I put slight amount of meiotic. I put some viscoelastic on the top, and then I push it in the center. But before I do that, I make sure I rotate the lens 10, 15 degrees each side. So that thing unfolds. Sometimes you can have one of the haptic which is not unfolded. So then you can get stuck up. Keratoconus patients, if I'm anticipating some changes in the angle, most of the times I go in, I do a, either a surgical aerodotomy or I do a YAG aerodotomy, especially in my keratoconus patients because I feel, you know, this gives me some sense of security because I have burned my fingers in one or two cases. So what I do is I do my irrigation aspiration first and only in small amount of viscoelastic, only in the area where I want the iris to be pushed back. I go there. So this saves time for me. I just go there and create a PI and the situation is over. Now this is what in case to, if you have to explant the lens. So I've demonstrated this hook technique and it's followed by most of the people who do write to me on the social media that they use it. It's very simple because the advantage being this lens has got so many holes, you can engage any one of those holes, go with a blunt instrument, engage the hole, pull the lens into the wound and you can pull the lens out of the same original wound without dilating it. So we'll just uh, see that. First trick is to make the side port instill viscoelastic first coat the endothelium then instill viscoelastic underneath the lens i've opened the 
old wound. I have not enlarged the wound. I have just opened my old wound. Now I instill some viscoelastic underneath the lens. So this viscoelastic starts lifting the lens. And the moment the lens is lifted up, I'll just fast forward. I just disengage it, bring it out from this side. And now I go from the main wound. I engage into one hole. I'll, I'll engage into the hole and hook it and pull it into the wound and leave it. Now you can use a needle holder. Do not use a tooth forceps. It will break the lens. Use a needle holder or a Macpherson and pull it out and it's over. It, it is out in 10 to 15 seconds. Now in case you have a high intraocular pressure which has gone up, call the patient after some time, after one hour, you see the cornea is a little hazy, it's steamy cornea, digitally the pressure is high. So what I do is we just put some slight amount of topical anesthetic, take a 26 gauge needle, bend it backwards and just burp it in the side port, you'll see. There, that's it. That's all you need to do and the pressure is normal. So the advantage being because when you're doing a fakic lens, you have two side ports. One is superior, one is inferior. So you always have an inferior side port. So these are some cases, high power cases. This is one uh, minus 29 with two diopter cylinders. This is uh, minus 34. Now this is a corneal scar. This is an interesting corneal scar. Look at the cylindrical power. It's minus 3.5 with 11 diopter cylinder. I'll skip this video, oh, this is interesting. Now we will see this case. Now this patient did fairly well. So I've gone in, you can see the corneal scar. I'm fast forwarding the video, put in the fakey lens. 11 diopters of toricity, bang on accuracy. Patient 612, unaided. Now this is again, a patient was roaming around. So I just had told him that we'll try. This is a, a patient who was hypermetropic, he was corrected with symphony, he had a residual power, anterior chamber was very shallow. So I ordered a fakey lens in plus power for this patient. So this patient did well. Now again, this is another case. Yeah, this is again another corneal scar. This is minus five cylinder, very small scar, but nearly in the center. So again, a fakey lens to correct. Patient did very well. Now you'll see some more interesting cases. Now this is a patient operated by me 18 years ago. Traumatic cataract, everything is opacified. The lens is stuck up. The lens is stuck up in the eye. It's totally fibrous. Pupil is stuck up. So what do I do? I do a little bit of iridotomy, open the iris and try and separate, create a space between the capsule and see, we, we have a lens which Minus 17 diopters. So this operates. Sorry, Kamal, our time is already up for the session. Okay, we have sir. One more speaker. Okay. So I would request. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And oh, excellent presentation, Kamal, and I think a lot to discuss, but uh, we are running out of time. Now we'll request Dr. Prakyat to come up and. So, uh, good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Prakhyat and I'll be presenting this new technology which is a very disruptive new technique of designing optics that, uh, that has been made available to us and we have been working on this for the past three years. Based on it, uh, Care Group has made a new IOL which is the Naturo. So what is this edgeless phase matching technology? These are my financial disclosures. And I'll set the tone of the presentation by asking you a very simple question. What are your top three concerns while implanting premium IOLs? Number one, what will be the distance vision of the patient? Will it get compromised? Will the patient have distance vision as good as a monofocal IOL? Because that is the first concern of the patient. Secondly, spectacle independence to what extent? Because Spectacle independence in real life means different things to different individuals. So will, will it be just a functional intermediate vision? Will it be a functional near vision? Or will it be a true spectacle independence for all things in life? And third is, what will be the quality of vision? What will be the side effects in the form of glare, starburst, night vision, dysphotopic phenomena, waxy vision, etc. So. Where we stand today is we have the EDOF technology, 
which we could group as the refractive based lenses. And we have the diffractive lenses where we know that the trifocals perform the best. So in the refractive technology, they are pupil dependent. Essentially, the optic is designed to be pupil dependent. And so the distance vision might be variable, just as we discussed in the previous talks, varying with the pupil size, the patient's refraction changes. And the intermediate vision may be acceptable to the patient. Sometimes they still may not be very satisfied. Near vision, definitely spectacles are required. But they have the advantage that you don't have the starburst. You don't have night driving problems as much as you would have in a diffractive lens. The trifocals, on the other hand, will give you a waxy vision, but the intermediate and near vision would be good. But the visual side effects in the form of waxy vision, starburst, night driving problems are going to be debilitating. And that is why there is a huge choice and a trade-off that you have to make for each and every patient. I want to ask the house with a show of hands, do diffractive steps in the IOL, the, the ramp and edge, have a, have a role in this photopic phenomena? Does everyone accept that it is a problem? Right, so they do have a problem and I tried solving it four years back. I made a presentation about it and uh, I failed. So diffractive IOLs have the problem of dysphotopic phenomena because of the steps and it is related to the number of steps, the angle of incidence of light and the height of the steps. So everybody, every IOL manufacturer in the world has tried to reduce the step heights and numbers, starting with the very first restore, which was an apodized diffractive lens. And they basically decided to reduce the step heights to reduce the side effects. And they themselves mentioned it in their patent, but nobody noticed it. Then comes the liberty, which says that we have reduced the steps by half, so the dysphotopic phenomena have reduced by half. And the latest is the continuous range of vision IOL, which is the, I, uh, the synergy, which is basically adding trifocality on the symphony platform. And it has basically merged two steps, so the edges are reduced to half, and the vision quality is improved along with getting a near focus. So it works even better. But nobody has come close to eliminating the steps forever. This is a very, very disruptive technology. This is not your incremental improvement over the previous existing technologies. This is no steps at all. Now, what is this edgeless phase matching technology? It is basically introducing negative kinoform phase matching for the first time in the world. This has never been used in camera optics. This has never been used in any other optical system ever, in any machine camera ever because it was not required. Why was it not required? Because cameras have a collimated beam of light. They don't have the problem of different range of light coming from different incidence angles. So this has a positive and a negative kinoform, which has been added to a base curve to give an LMAX profile, which is a proprietary of this lens. This profile has absolutely no steps. So all of the incidence light is going to be used to make an image which is useful, sharp on a particular focus. So there is no wasted light as it would be at the edge of a diffractive IOL. So you can see that there is complete, complete elimination of all the edges. At the same time, it is powered by the live vision technology wherein it is neither pupil dependent, it is absolutely pupil independent, but is also distributing light in such a way that it matches the ocular physiology. So you can see the visual MTF data, and it shows that at outdoor daylight situations, the MTF is very close to a monofocal IOL. So the vision quality for distance is absolutely uncompromised, while for indoor ambient light conditions, it gives you an additional near and intermediate. And for reading in low light conditions, it has a best performing 
near vision. So compared to an EDOF or a trifocal lens, the night driving starburst is significantly reduced. The broad daylight waxy vision is gone. And you have absolutely crisp reading vision. Compare it to the panoptics, and you can see that the visual MTF for all the foci is significantly outperforming, especially in the intermediate. So this disruptive technology, we have been using it for the past three years in the trial, and we have the data now. It gives us uncompromised distance vision, sharp intermediate vision, superior reading vision, which everyone has promised, but nobody has ever delivered yet. So we have this dictum that whatever we can see on the reflex of the patient on a streak or on a direct ophthalmoscope is what the patient is going to see. And you can compare the reflexes. So we have done about 500 eyes, and we have had binocularly reading vision of N6 in 96% patients, uncorrected vision of 6 by 6 and better in 100% cases. And in fact, we have had at least 100 patients who have had 6 by 5 distance vision uncorrected, which was a huge surprising thing for me. Disturbing starburst, waxy vision, photic phenomena, absolutely nil. We have done it in a very varied cohort just to push the limits and see how well it performs. So we have had one eye implanted with a pan optics and not satisfied with it, and implanted this lens, Naturo, in the other eye and have had the patient jumping and literally coming back to us with their relatives and friends to get the new lens done. And we have had it in monofocal patients, patients with a monofocal in the other eye, and we have implanted Naturo in the other, the second eye, and they have had excellent results, very good acceptance with functional spectacle independence because of that eye. We have done clear lens exchange for very high myopes, high hyperopia, even post LASIK and post RK patients. This is the uh, defocus curve of the lens. So it, it is basically very tolerant to a uh, under correction also. And you can see that up to 0 0.5, it still remains at uh, plus 0 0.5. It still remains at 6 by 7.5, which is very nice. These are a few examples of the initial cases we did. So we implanted it in one-eyed patients also, and then uh, even in post-traumatic young, young chap did not want to wear spectacles. The surgical technique is fairly simple. We have done the trial on the uh, hydrophilic version, and uh, the surgical technique is fairly easy. I know everybody is an expert cataract surgeon. Who am I to tell? So this is how the reflex looks. And uh, this is the IOL specifications of the model that we're using right now. And you just see this patient talking about the problem that he was facing with the pan optics in the other eye. And then we did a Naturo, and you see the response. Uh, sound. So this patient basically says that he had a problem that when a, light, a distant object would approach him, the light would have multiple rings, and he would not be able to judge the distance of the vehicle because of the ghost images. So he says that because of the lack of judgment of the distance, I could have met with an accident. And that is how disturbing the problem is to me. And then we did Naturo for him in the other eye. Naturo pan focal avoid implantation of Naturo pan focal IOL in the left eye. The patient was happy with his left eye vision. He was made to read the vision charts for different working distances. So he was easily able to read. 6x6 six six at all the testing distances. So he was better than N6. And
So basically, he was the first patient who actually gave us the information that there is a difference and that is when we started exploring this possibility. So Naturo gives us a natural quality vision at all distances. You don't need to care about the pupil size. You don't need to care about the patient's need. You can just ask him if he wants spectacle independence and you can go for it. It requires minimum chair time. You can advise it, implant it, and forget about it. You don't need to give him a disclaimer about distance vision and near vision and things like that. Excellent night driving vision, true spectacle freedom. Thank you. I think, any questions? So this is commercially available now? So it is being launched now, so we can make our way to care booth to know about it. Because even I don't know about the commercial aspects of it. They're okay. launching it. Very nice. Congratulations. And uh, Dad said it won at the ACRS in the technology forum. Brilliant. So basically, we helped them um, in doing the phase matching of this optics. But it is a very difficult, very, very difficult thing to manufacture. So kudos to them to be able to manufacture it. The machining part is very challenging. You think it can be made in the hydrophobic platform also? Yes, sir. The plan is to basically have it in the hydrophobic platform. This is just for that. We did it in the trial. We liked it so much that we are continuing to use it. And it's being launched in the hydrophilic also for the cost benefit. And uh, maybe hydrophobic will come in the next couple of months. Thank you so much, and I think we had a very interesting session covering a gamut of uh, topics and uh, some of the newest innovations that the CAG group has brought in. And uh, thank you for organizing this symposium, and thank you for staying on. I thank my co-moderators for being present here. Thank you.